So yeah, my name is Emily. Um, I am indeed Lois's granddaughter. Um, I am currently a PhD student at the Berkeley School of Information. My background is in computer science, but now I'm in this very interdisciplinary PhD program where I really work at the intersection of computer science and development economics and thinking about how we can use the tools from AI and big data to try to improve conditions and conditions in the developing world. Um, I like to think that my, so my, my mom's dad, my maternal grandfather, Harold Widom was a math professor at UCSC and my grandmother, Lois, was a social worker. And I really like to think that I get to really combine the best of those two worlds together to do this work on trying to use algorithms to make people's lives better. Okay, so that's a little bit about me. Um, I'm gonna launch into a pretty lengthy talk about this research project. project. So please just, as I said, feel free to interrupt me. Um, let me start by saying that this project is something I've been working on for about a year, but it's really a collaboration with a bunch of wonderful people, um, including my advisor, Josh Blumenstock at uh, Berkeley, but also professors from Northwestern and the University of Mannheim. So this is really a team effort. Um, okay, so I'm gonna just have this quick agenda slide and I'll come back to this as we go through the talk to kind of keep some structure. I'm gonna give some background and context on COVID in Togo. Um, I'm going to talk about this problem we're really trying to address, which is how to find poor people to give money to. Like during the pandemic, poor people really, really need money to be able to um, keep their lives going, but it can be really hard to actually figure out who to give that money to. And so that's the core question we're going to try to be answering. I'm going to talk a lot about the techniques from AI and sort of algorithmic methods that we use to do that. Um, I'm going to present some preliminary results on how accurately we were actually able to do that in Togo. Then I'm going to talk about some of the ethical questions embedded in using AI in these kinds of contexts, which I think are really interesting, potentially as interesting as the technical questions, and I hope you'll find um, equally fascinating. And then I'll talk a little bit about what kind of ongoing research we have. This is definitely a project that's really still in progress, so you're kind of getting a snapshot partway through, but it's still, there's still a lot going on. All right, so starting off with just a little bit of context, probably many of you are aware that COVID and this pandemic has actually set back sort of progress out of poverty in the world quite starkly. So you can look at this graph on the upper left here, which is showing you kind of the projections of people moving out of poverty globally going into the future, that's the black line. Um, that was the pre-pandemic projection and then the colored lines are showing you various projections that happened during the pandemic. So we're looking at like 100 million people approximately being pushed into extreme poverty as a result of the economic downturn from the COVID pandemic. So in addition to all the health costs, like this is a really, really big deal. Um, in response, basically most countries in the world, including my own country, the US, have launched targeted social protection programs that are meant to give aid to the people that need it most during these really hard times. So in Africa alone, 30 different African countries launched social protection programs in response to COVID-19. Um, and then just all over the world, you saw this happening. It was like an incredible scale up. That's what this bottom right graph is showing, just this incredible scale up in social protection programs um, during the pandemic. But the sort of central problem to social protection programs is that typically you have a limited budget you only have like N dollars that was approved by your government to spend and everybody wants that money, but only some people really, really need it. And so the central problem is this problem that we call targeting in development economics. It's figuring out who should get the money that you have, this limited budget that you have. Um, probably a lot of you are aware of how that worked in the US and how it works in many developed countries. Typically what you'll have, like what we had for the, um, for the checks that were given out in the US is the government took um, tax returns and tax returns have really good records of income, right? So you have exactly everybody's income and then everybody below a certain income level received aid. So that's called means testing is kind of the fancy name for that. Um, unfortunately in developing countries where many people are working in the informal sector, often a lot of people are farmers, um, people are outside of the tax net you don't have that really good record of income for everybody. Like I think in Togo, for example, 10% of people are inside the tax net. So you don't really know who's wealthy and who's poor on that kind of official level. Um, 
And so as a result, in the last like 20 years, development economists have been coming up with all kinds of sort of clever proxy ways of trying to figure out who should get money, trying to solve this targeting problem um, based on proxies like measuring what kind of assets people own based on what's called community-based targeting, which is going into communities and sort of collaboratively figuring out who needs um, money based on just giving money in certain areas that's called geographic targeting. So I'm gonna come back to, um, to these different methods a little bit later on in the, talk, in the talk, but basically all of these measures are proxies and so they have some error. Um, and then there's the even sort of bigger challenge is that during COVID-19, first of all, it's a huge economic shock. So it becomes much harder to figure out who's wealthy and who's poor. Maybe there's some people who are sort of new poor who weren't poor before the pandemic. Um, and then also it's very hard to go in person and actually sort of interview people to figure out who needs money. So we need to come up with new contact free ways of identifying beneficiaries and solving this targeting problem. So basically long story short, targeting is a really hard problem, even harder during the COVID pandemic. Okay, so that brings me to the context for our study, which is Togo. Probably when you saw the name of this talk, many of you just the first question you had was where is Togo? Togo is a little tiny slivery country um, in West Africa. It's just east of Ghana, it's French speaking. Um, its population is about 8 million and basically this figure on the right is just like a zoomed in map of Togo. Togo is largely rural and then there's one real urban center which is um, right on the ocean on the border with Ghana. Um, that's the capital city, its name is Lome and about a quarter of the population lives there. So it's just a little background on Togo. Um, like many other countries in April, when the pandemic first kind of hit, um, a lot of Togo went into lockdown. So the entire capital city, Lome, was put into a very strict lockdown on April 1st. Um, and then just about a week later, Togo announced this really ambitious social protection program called Novisi, which was going to provide aid um, to people in the area of the lockdown in the capital city. Um, Novisi is kind of an amazing social protection program. For one thing, it was built by this incredible team from the Togolese government in 10 days, which is just mind blowing. They're just like a really amazing group of engineers and an amazing team. It's also entirely contactless. It's delivered via mobile money. So when you think about the stimulus checks in the US, those were sent out as like physical checks in a lot of cases. Um, in Togo, they actually completely bypassed that and made it entirely digital, which is just incredible um, by taking advantage of really high mobile phone penetration. So almost everyone in Togo or every household has at least one mobile phone. And then also, um, as is very common in Africa and the developing world more generally, most of those phones are enabled with mobile money. And mobile money is like, again, this just really incredible technology that allows you to share and send money just using your phone. So basically your phone number becomes a unique ID for you to use as basically a mini banking system. So mobile money is just like incredible for financial inclusion in general, but it also enabled this entirely contact free aid program where the government was able to send people money completely remotely, just delivering it straight to their phone. Um, so the program was made, the people in Lome, the capital city, were made eligible for that program. They received about $20 um, a month during the lockdown. And in terms of this targeting problem, which is really what's central to our talk, the way they decided to do that was um, to provide money to anybody in Lome who was in an informal occupation. So people um, who were driving taxis, who were market vendors, hair cutters, um, like stay at home, people who were just staying at home who were unemployed, all of those were considered informal occupations and therefore eligible for no VC aid. Um, no VC aid went to almost 500,000 people or about 10% of Togo's population during that time in the spring, which again is just like really incredible scale. Um, Ravi has a good question in the chat. Hi, Ram. Um, so many, so many lovely people on this talk. Um, asking, is the mobile banking system secure? That's a super great question. And I think more generally, the question of financial inclusion via mobile money and via mobile bank banking is a really interesting question. Um, maybe instead of going down that whole road, I'm going to point you to some different resources and some really interesting papers on this. And I'll put that in the chat at the end. Um, the short version is that the mobile banking system is fairly secure to the extent that we trust sort of 
mobile network operators um, and the governments that regulate those operators. All right, I'm gonna keep going. Um, so Novisi was like, as I mentioned, there's sort of a huge scale up of social protection programs all over the world and all over the developing world. But Novisi was really lauded as being like this incredible example of this. And it got tons of really positive press with everyone from Esther Duflo, who was the winner of the Nobel Prize in economics last year, to people from the World Bank, to just um, all kinds of policy and news coverage just being really positive about Novisi. And I'm not saying they didn't deserve that. They absolutely did. That was, it was an incredible program. And also to be built in 10 days is just amazing. Um, but there was one central problem with Novisi, which is that Novisi was only eligible, only available to people in urban areas. Um, and what we're showing here in this graphic right is that actually the sort of the economic impacts of COVID-19 were just as harsh in Togo in rural areas as in urban areas. So even though the urban areas were the ones under lockdown, people in rural areas were really feeling the economic impacts as well. So what we're looking at here is, um, this is from, in, from data from a survey that we conducted in my research group in June, a nationally representative survey of Togo. Um, in orange, we're, looking, we're asking people, what was your income in the past week? And then in blue, we were asking, what was your income in a week pre-pandemic? And so you can see that in both urban and rural areas, it's like a really scary drop between the pre-pandemic and post-pandemic income. And it's pretty much the same across urban and rural areas. So because of this sort of discovery that in fact, the economic impacts were just as bad outside of the lockdown area as inside, the government of Togo became really interested in this idea of giving out some money, some Novisi social protection payments in rural areas, as well as urban ones. The big challenge there is that it's really not clear how to identify poor people in rural parts of Togo. In the urban areas in the city, they use this, this criteria of being in an informal occupation to try to identify people who really needed aid. But in rural areas, almost everyone's a farmer. And so it becomes really hard to figure out who to give money to and who to not give money to, assuming that you don't have enough money to pay everyone, which was the case. Um, so that's where my research group came in and the research I've been doing in the last year. More specifically, actually, this sort of developed this three-way partnership between the government of Togo, um, this team that built the Novisi platform in particular, my research lab at UC Berkeley, and then Give Directly, which is this international NGO that really specializes in doing these direct cash transfers where they just give out money to people and they've worked all over the world in different areas. Give Directly had about $8 million in funding that they'd just gotten to give out COVID aid in Africa. Um, and they came to us and to the government with an interest in giving out this aid in rural parts of Togo using the algorithms that my team had been working on for um, identifying poor people and solving this targeting problem. Um, from September to November, so about three months in the fall, I was in Togo with the Give Directly and the government teams. This picture in the lower right is some of us all at the beach one day. It was really, really fun time hanging out with some really awesome people. Um, so we all worked together for about three months to build out this platform. And then um, in the winter, these past couple months, there have been about 30,000 transfers distributed to Togolese people living in poverty in rural areas and about 70,000 more transfers are scheduled to be dispersed um, starting in about three weeks, which is really exciting. So the rest of this talk is going to be about how we actually did that, how we sort of found those people and solved the targeting problem in rural Togo. Before I keep going, does anybody want to ask any questions about sort of the general setup, conditions in Togo, anything else? Well, how much, how much money does the average Togolese have? What, what can they do with $20? Great question. Um, the average income and consumption, I'll use those two measures um, a lot. Income is like how much money you're bringing in. Consumption is how much money you're spending. Consumption is typically the gold standard measure of poverty in developing countries. Um, and the average consumption in Togo is about $2 a day or $60 a month. So $20 is about one third of the, the typical person's uh, consumption. And I guess it's also another number worth keeping in mind is that the international poverty line is $1.9 per day. So about half of Togo lives below the international poverty line. It's a very poor country. 
see also a question in the chat. Does the Togolese government support NGOs? That's a really interesting question. Um, the Togolese government turns out to be very complicated. Um, there's a lot of different arms and different groups and I can only speak to the one that I worked with, which is the Ministry of, um, it's, not, it's not actually a good translation, the Ministère de l'Economie Numérique, which is like the Ministry of Digital Economy. Um, and this particular ministry works a lot with NGOs and was super supportive of this particular Sorry. project. Um, so they, they, they in particular were really worked a lot with NGOs. Um, I can't speak to the rest of the government. Other questions? Did the team need to work in French, Mark is asking. Yes, mostly. Um, I'm lucky that I learned French in high school and it became really useful for this project. I speak much better French now than I did a year ago. Um, no one in Togo really speaks English outside of the government, so most of the work was done in French. And I'm lucky to have a French collaborator who was also very helpful for that. For some of the population can read and write. Oh, I don't know this one off the top of my head, but I should. Um, it's pretty like basic literacy is pretty high. I want to say maybe 70%. Um, I do know that it's much lower among women than among men. That became really, it's actually a really important question um, to the extent that like to be able to register for this program registration was done over the phone. And so being able to send sort of basic text messages and do basic writing was really important. And then another question, does the 30,000 already paid and the 70,000 to be paid in April cover the problem? That's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, it's, um, I think that it's a more complicated question that I wish I could answer it more directly. Um, let's like the simple answer, I guess, is that, like I said, about 50% of Togolese leave, live below the poverty line. So just reaching 100,000 people is like not really enough. It was how much money Give Directly had. So that's what we've been focused on is like how best to distribute those 100,000 transfers. Um, but certainly like but to be able to reach every Togolese below the poverty line, it's not nearly enough. Um, at the same time, the government of Togo has been giving out a lot of aid in parallel, which has been helpful, um, but basically not enough. I think more generally, there's a question of like, actually given a certain budget, it might make more sense to like give a lot of money to very few people to really lift them out of poverty. So there's some really interesting literature in development economics looking at like, actually, if you really want to permanently change someone's life, you need to give them like a thousand dollars or more. So um, it might actually be sort of more long term impactful to give a lot of money to very few people and like really solve the problem for them versus to give like very short term aid to a lot of people. In this case, we decided to try to cover more people with smaller transfers because of sort of the short term nature of the COVID pandemic. Um, Nancy asked a really good question. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but to paraphrase um, about, is there any particular effort to make sure that the money goes to women since women are known to sort of be the ones who are gonna spend it more on their children, more on education, more on healthcare. So actually, great question. Um, I'm gonna maybe put some resources on Novici into the chat later, but in this particular aid program, more money was given to women than men. So when people registered, they registered with their national ID card, which connected to a national database, which had like their voter ID number, gender and occupation, which is how they figured out if people were um, informal or not to give them money for the Novici program in Lome. And that also had gender. And so if they were a woman, they were given about $2 more. I think it was about $20 for women and $18 per month for men. So actually a little bit more money was given to women uh, than men. And there also was particular effort to try to encourage women to register for the program in terms of advertising. Any other questions? These are all really, really good questions. I'm happy to answer more. Okay, in that case, I'm gonna keep going into some of the more algorithmic um, type of stuff. But yeah, again, feel free to ask questions so I go along and interrupt. Okay, so um, actually, I'm gonna stay on the slide for one second. In order to be able to identify people as beneficiaries for this program, we actually sort of did two steps. The first thing we did was identify areas of the country where the program would be run. So the program was only run in certain parts of Togo. And a lot of the reason for that was like 
there was actually a lot of effort put into advertising the program and mobilizing people to register for the aid program. And that kind of intensive advertising effort could only be done in like certain areas. It was too expensive basically to run in the whole country. So first we selected certain areas to run the program in. This is what's typically called geographic targeting. And then within those areas, we identified the poorest people to receive money. And that's what I'll call individual targeting. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the methods that we used for both. And basically they both use a lot of machine learning. Um, so that's why they're, I guess, a bit exciting and novel. First on the geographic targeting front. So typically what a country would do if they wanted to select areas to run an aid program in um, is that rather than surveying every single person in the country to try to figure out where the poorest people live, because that would be extremely expensive, they just survey a representative sample of the population and they create a poverty map that shows which areas have the poorest people and which areas have the wealthiest people. Um, Togo last did that in 2017, the sort of National Statistical Institute did this. They surveyed around 30,000 people um, and their poverty map, which is shown here at the right is representative at the prefecture level. So prefectures are kind of like states in Togo, there's 40 of them. Um, and so this told, Basically, this poverty map tells you for each state how poor are the people there relative to the other states. Just as a sense of scale, um, this survey cost well over a million dollars. I'm not exactly sure of the actual cost, but basically these types of large 30,000 per person surveys are like multi-million dollar endeavors. Um, so that's what a, a country would typically do if they wanted to do geographic targeting. Um, but in this case, we wanted to actually be able to target smaller areas than that. So the problem with a map like the one I showed on the previous slide, oops, um, hang on, sorry. The problem with a map like this one is that we are only able to select states or prefectures to run the program at, but actually the pockets of poverty are typically much smaller than a prefecture. They're typically really smaller areas. And so to be able to run the program in the really like poorest, poorest areas of the country, you wanna be able to select at a sort of higher resolution than at the prefecture level. So what we did instead was we used satellite imagery and machine learning. So this is the first, we have sort of two places where the machine learning algorithms came into this project. And this is the first one is with satellite imagery. What we did is we got two kilometer by two kilometer satellite tiles for all of Togo. Um, and then we used a particular machine learning algorithm called a convolutional neural network to extract important features from those satellite tiles. I'm not going to go into tons of details on the technical aspect. If anybody's interested, I can point you to the papers where actually the methods are discussed in detail. But intuitively, the way to think about this is that certain types of things that you can observe in satellite imagery are very predictive of whether or not areas are wealthy and areas are poor. Those are kind of intuitive. You can think about like the material of the roads or the roads of a good quality is something you can observe from satellite imagery. Another thing is, are the roofs of buildings made from good materials? Are they made of thatch or are they made of, you know, um, metal? Another thing is um, access to drinking water. Is a town near to a water source? Is there a lot of greenery around? Does it look like the farmland is of good quality? So all of these things are really predictive of whether rural areas are wealthy or whether they're poor and they're all able to be observed just from these satellite tiles. And then the machine learning just comes down to basically all we want to do is find systematic ways to extract these patterns from the satellite imagery from the underlying unstructured data. And machine learning just a really good way of systematically extracting these patterns. Um, I see a couple of questions in the chat. I'm just going to come back to them at the end of the slide. Um, so once we'd obtained the satellite imagery, once we'd extracted these features, thousands of these, what I'm calling features, these different aspects of the satellite imagery, um, we then obtained 6,000 ground truth data points from a survey that was conducted pre-pandemic. So when I say ground truth, I mean, these were surveys that were conducted with households where we know the exact location of the household so we can match that household to the corresponding satellite tile. And we also obtain the actual level of poverty of that household, the true poverty, which we measure in terms of consumption. So how much did that household actually spend in the last week? And then we train a supervised learning, again, a machine learning algorithm to predict wealth from those features from the satellite imagery. So we learn 
how much does um, having good road quality predict being a wealthy village? How much does having thatched roofs predict being a poor village? And so on and so forth for these thousands of different features. And so we're able to train an algorithm that's actually very good at predicting uh, consumption from the satellite imagery. I'm gonna come back to the chat just uh, at the end of this section in a couple more slides. And so just so you can see what this looks like, at left, what we have is all of these satellite tiles, the predicted level of consumption. And you can really see that down here in the capital city in Lome, there's much higher predicted wealth than in basically all the rest of the country. And you can see that the north of the country, all of these areas are poorer than the capital city. But you can also see that these pockets of real poverty are very small, right? It's not like a whole state is poor, it's that these, these really like pockets of deep poverty around the country. So we took these satellite tiles, we overlaid them with high resolution data on population density also obtained from satellite imagery. And we used that to calculate the consumption or predicted, let's say, consumption via machine learning of every canton in the country. Cantons in Togo are like counties, there's about 400 of them. And then we use these levels of consumption obtained from satellite imagery for each canton to identify the 100 poorest cantons in Togo, which is where we ran the aid program. And in the end, you can see it's about what you would expect, that most of those cantons are in the north of the country, which is the poorest, but we have a few scattered throughout the country. All right, so that's kind of the end of the section on machine learning and satellite data. I'm going to answer a couple questions from the chat, and if there's other um, questions, feel free to, to shout them out or put them in the chat. Um, Robbie asked about funding. The project's funded through a variety of sources. I'll actually acknowledge them at the end, so I'm going to save that. Um, and then Susan asked about education, um, especially in rural areas and especially women, which is a really important question. As I said before, um, registration for the program and like the ability to actually register and receive aid was definitely mediated by literacy and education. Um, so Education in Togo is not often great, especially among women. Um, many women drop out of school before eight years of education, um, many more than men. So um, definitely not um, sort of not the level of education that we're used to in the US. Um, and I guess also worth noting that actually schools were closed in much of Togo as a result of COVID for a few months. Um, and so we were really hoping that the aid being given out by Give Directly could help keep kids in school or help pay for school fees because schools were just reopening in the fall when the aid was being distributed. We're actually doing a separate study to evaluate whether that actually helped. Um, Robbie asked what the size of Togo. Um, so Togo's size is about 8 million. That's actually almost exactly the same size as Switzerland, if that's helpful. Um, do they speak French? Yeah, so French is like the lingua franca. Um, most people speak French, particularly if they're educated. Everybody in the capital city speaks French. And there's about 30 different local languages um, in all of Togo in like various parts. It's like super linguistically diverse, which is fascinating. And also like really interesting for just the logistics of running an aid program. Like they did advertisements for the program over the radio and had to do them in like so many different languages. We also ran a bunch of phone surveys to sort of gather, gather this ground truth data on wealth. And those surveys had to be done in like 30 different languages, which was also really interesting. Okay, I see there's so much, there's so many questions, which is great. Um, Robbie asked about education fees. Um, education is close to free, but then typically students have to pay for their own uniform and books. So there is some fee to being able to go to school. Um, how expensive is mobile phone service for an individual? Really interesting question. I'm gonna come back to mobile phone ownership and mobile phone service at the end. So I'm gonna save that. Um, and okay, this is the last one I'm gonna answer and then I'm gonna keep going so that I don't keep you all um, way, way past the time I'm supposed to. Um, where is individual income mainly coming from? Also a really interesting question. So in rural areas, typically most income is coming from agriculture. So it's maybe not even income. A lot of people are like subsistence farmers. So this is one of the reasons that we don't actually use income to measure poverty in the developing world typically is because so many people are subsistence and are just growing their own food. Maybe they don't even really have income in that sense, but they are growing food for themselves to eat. Um, other people are uh, in sort of various informal types of work. Um, 
also like sort of selling food at markets, um, various kinds of typical informal labor. Okay, thank you. Okay, I love all the questions. Please feel free to keep asking. I'll probably kind of do what I did now, which is save the questions for a few slides uh, and answer them at the end of a section. All right, so next I'm gonna be talking about individual targeting. So after we selected areas to run the program in, the next step was to select which people in those areas would actually receive the aid. We wanted to make sure the aid was really going to the poorest people in those areas. Um, and we did that, spoiler alert, with mobile phone data and more machine learning. But first I'm gonna just briefly for context, talk about what you would typically do for individual targeting and how, why we weren't able to do that in the context of the pandemic. So I mentioned at the beginning that sort of the best way of choosing people for eligibility, the best way of targeting would be this thing called means testing where you actually figure out who is the poorest in terms of either income or consumption um, and then provide them with aid. The reason this isn't really feasible is that it requires either, like I said at the beginning, good records of income via something like tax returns, like this administrative records, which don't exist in the developing world, or it would require going to every single person in Togo and doing about a two or three hour survey to determine what their actual level of consumption is. Consumption is extremely expensive to measure because you have to ask them you have, to, you have to ask them all these questions to figure out how much money they actually spent in the last week. That's actually a very challenging question to answer. Um, an alternative and slightly cheaper method would be to use something called an asset index. This is pretty common in developing countries. So instead of trying to measure consumption, which is really expensive, you might instead just measure something about how many possessions a person has. So it's fairly common to go to households and ask how many fridges do you own? How many TVs do you own um, a good working toilet? Is your roof made of good materials? Are your walls made of good materials? And like about 20 questions like that and basically form kind of a poverty score based on these so-called assets. Um, that's cheaper than consumption because it's so much easier to measure in a short survey, but it's still really expensive because you have to talk to every single person to be able to um, figure out who's wealthy and who's poor. Yet another option is something called community-based targeting. This has become pretty popular lately, which is that in every village, either their community leaders like the village chief or potentially sort of in a collaborative exercise with the community members, you would determine who's eligible for aid. So they would sort of select themselves the wealthiest and poorest people and make sure aid's channeled to the poorest people. The challenge with that is that it's like super subject to favoritism. So for example, a chief could choose to give money only to their family members. Um, but more generally, the real problems with either of these two options, either the asset index or the community-based targeting, which are kind of the standard targeting methods used in developing countries right now, are that A, they're actually not that accurate. They have a lot of errors of inclusion, so people who shouldn't be getting money who do, and errors of exclusion, people who should be getting money but don't get any money. So they're, first of all, very subject to errors. And second of all, they're really expensive. So you have to go and talk to every single person or run these really expensive community targeting exercises. And third, and most importantly, in the context of the pandemic, they require going in person. So these would require actually going to every village or every household and talking to people. And we wanted to develop something that was contact free and so it could be safely done during the pandemic. And that's why we turned to this alternative idea of using big data sources um, to predict who's wealthy and who's poor. There's not a lot of big data sources coming out of the developing world. Like in the US, we think about big data and we have the internet and we have all this data that's recorded about us from smartphones and like so much sort of creepy, but also really rich data being recorded about us all the time that might be really predictive of welfare. In the developing world, we don't have that, but we, what we do have is that almost every single person owns a mobile phone. I see a question in the chat about don't the poorest not have cell phones? Great question, and I'll come back to that towards the end. Um, for now, let's just think the fact that like most people have a mobile phone. In Togo, about 90% of households have a mobile phone. Um, and the way people use their phones can be super, super predictive of who's wealthy and who's poor, so that can be really informative for targeting aid. Just to give a little outline of how this actually works, 
Um, we obtained about two years of mobile phone metadata from Togo's two mobile phone operators. They only have two operators and they have a complete duopoly on the market. Um, what this mobile phone metadata looks like, sometimes it's called call detail records. So you might hear me call it CDR, which is an abbreviation, but it's just this mobile phone metadata. Um, basically what we see is for every call and text placed on the mobile phone network, we see the date, time, duration, um, and phone number, the phone number that made the call, the phone number that received it, and also what cell tower the call pinged off of, which gives you like a measure of geography. For every mobile money transaction, I talked about mobile money at the beginning. Um, for every mobile money transaction where someone sends someone else money, we see the date and time that occurred, how much money it was, and what, again, which phone number sent to which other phone number. And then also we observe things about mobile data usage. So if they're like surfing the internet on their smartphone, we can see how much they're using. From, but we don't see anything like uh, the content of text messages or the content of phone calls or anything. It's all what's called metadata. From all of this like massive gigabytes or terabytes, it's really terabytes of data, we calculate for each of the 6 million uh, phone subscribers on the network in Togo, we calculate thousands, again, what I'm going to call features that describe things about the way they use their phone. We calculate things like how many calls they made how much mobile data they used, how many international calls. Did they make short calls or long calls? Were most of their calls coming in from other people or were most of their calls going out? How many different people did they send text messages to? And like thousands and thousands of others. Um, we then actually conducted a phone survey of 10,000 mobile phone subscribers to obtain what I'm gonna call again, ground truth information about poverty. So we interviewed 10,000 people and ask them all these questions to determine their actual level of poverty using consumption. Um, and then we match that to their mobile phone features. As I said before, we just use machine learning to extract the patterns of how wealthy people use their phones and how poor people use their phones. So machine learning is just a really good way of systematically extracting these patterns. So we know that if someone makes five more calls than someone else, that means they're likely to be 10% more wealthy or something like that, I'm making that up. Um, and so on and so forth for all the thousands of other features until we've built this really complex machine learning model that predicts wealth from all of these thousands of features. Um, again, if people are interested in the sort of nitty gritty technical details, I can point to a couple of the papers or talk more at the end about how the machine learning really works. Um, just a couple slides of to kind of show some visualizations for how this worked. I will say this sounds easy, but it's like, extremely complicated. It's ex like there's so much logistics going into this. For one thing, we conducted this phone survey of 10,000 people in Togo in, um, in the fall to train the algorithm. Conducting a phone survey during COVID was definitely an adventure. These are some pictures of my, my friend Suzanne and our colleague Stanislas conducting the survey. And in particular here, they're training the enumerators in this giant room with everybody wearing masks and socially distant. Um, to be able to just gather the ground truth data that we used. Um, from, like I said, we matched this ground truth data to the, the features obtained from the mobile phone data. And these are just some visualizations. So you can kind of get some intuition for why we might expect people who are poor to use their phones differently from people who are wealthy. Um, these are called kernel density estimates. They just show the distribution of the feature for, um, for poor people versus rich people. So of the 10,000 people in the survey, for people who are relatively rich above the poverty line, they're shown in blue. And people who are relatively poor below the poverty line, they're shown in orange. And so for example, what this one on the upper left is showing you is that rich people shown in blue tend to be active for more days than poor people shown in orange. So we can see here, most of those rich people look like they're active for around 100 to 200 days. Um, most of the poor people are active closer to zero days out of the time period. And we did that again for, again, we have thousands of features. I'm just showing six here. Um, another example here is the number of different cell antennas that you're going to, that you use in that whole time period. You can see that the rich people, again, shown in blue, tend to use more antennas on the x-axis than the, the poor people shown in orange. And again, you can, like, I'm just showing six features here, but there's thousands. Um, from all of these underlying features, we train a machine learning model that lets us predict actual consumption from uh, the mobile phone features. 
And what we're plotting on the graph on the left here is that on the x-axis, we have how poor is someone really? How much money are they spending per day in truth based on talking to them on the phone survey? Versus on the y-axis, we have how poor did our model predict that they would be? And you can see that this is far from perfect. These predictions aren't like 100% accurate, but there's definitely a pretty strong correlation between how poor they really are and how poor we predicted them to be. Lastly, on the right here, in case you're interested, I thought it would be um, cool to show what kind of the most important things going into this model are, just for some intuition. As I keep saying, there's thousands of features, but we can look at what the most important ones are, which ones are getting sort of the biggest weight in this model. And we can see one thing that's really important is how many, what percentage of your calls are made at night. So people that are making a lot of calls at night tend to be nighttime laborers. Um, they're gonna be poorer on average than people who are making most of their calls during the day. Another really important feature is what percentage of your calls were placed in the capital city. You might expect people that are either living in the capital city or commuting there to work tend to be richer than people who are staying in rural areas. Um, what else here is interesting? Another one is the number of antennas or the, sorry, the radius of gyration is like the distance that you're traveling on average. People that seem to be traveling more distance based on their cell tower locations tend to be richer than people who are traveling less distance, so on and so forth. Um, there's a bunch of different features that are important. Um, lastly, before I get to the questions on the chat, just to finish off with what we did. So we, everybody, every of the 6 million subscribers in Togo was associated with a predicted consumption based on their mobile phone data. And then people with, a, um, with their predicted consumption below a certain threshold, in this case, the threshold was $1.25 per day, were eligible to receive aid. So in order to receive aid, you had to meet two criteria. Well, first you had to register for the program. Then you had to be registered in one of the cantons that was selected to run the program in. And then lastly, you had to have predicted consumption based on mobile phone data below $1.25 per day. All right, before I go to a little bit of results and um, additional thoughts, I'm going to answer a couple more questions from the chat. Okay, the questions, like I said, about poor not having phones, I'm gonna come back to that uh, in about five minutes, so just hang tight. Um, and then from Sheila, I have our calls cost based on the amount of data, international calls, like what we do here. Great question and very important for why this actually works. Um, so yeah, there's really interesting phone plans in Togo. Like the phone plans sort of change on a daily basis and they're constantly having these specials and all of this stuff. But essentially mobile data is expensive. How much you pay from mobile data depends on how much you use. Um, so you like prepay for you know a gigabyte or whatever. And then when that runs out, you buy another one. Um, also, international calls are really expensive if you place an outgoing international call. Beyond that, it's like uh, a text message costs, I want to say, I don't remember, a few cents. And then uh, a phone call uh, depends on how long your phone call is. Um, but it's pretty similar to what we have here, I would say, on the whole. <laughs> Based on the curve shown, what can machine learning do better compared to an Excel spreadsheet? That's funny. Um, I don't know if I would be able to code this in Excel, just like because Excel has limited coding capabilities. So that's one thing. Um, also, uh, yeah, Excel would not be able to like crunch the massive terabytes of data that we're using. So that's two things. I think more generally, Excel is actually like one tool that we can use to handle data and potentially even do machine learning, like a linear regression in Excel is machine learning. Um, but Excel is like, so limited in terms of interface that it's much easier to do this stuff in like Python or another programming language. And then Robbie asked, do people use WhatsApp to avoid costly international calls? This is a really good question. Um, this might be a question like this is like the reason that this kind of method might not work in like 10 years. Right now, most people in Togo don't have smartphones. Most people have what's called feature phones, which are like not smartphones. Like if you think back to maybe what you had 10 years ago or I don't know, 20 years ago, um, that was probably a feature phone where you couldn't use data. You could just make calls and place texts. Um, so because of that, most people in Togo use that, uh, use just calls and texts, but perhaps in 10 years, that's going to look different. And already, especially in the capital city in Lome, a lot of people are using smartphones and using WhatsApp. Any other questions? 
Cool. I think I have about 10, maybe 15 minutes to go. Um, does $2 a day allow a decent diet? That's a really interesting question. Um, maybe I'll point you to some papers uh, at the end of the talk. Um, $2 a day is definitely enough to allow a decent diet, but we actually see when we look at what poor people are choosing to spend their money on, you often see that they're choosing to spend money on things that are not food. Not to say that they're necessarily choosing to spend it on like, uh, like goods that aren't what you like, like sort of bad things like cigarettes or alcohol, but there's lots of other stuff like children's education, healthcare costs, um, investing in small businesses, all of this kind of thing. So often people who are very poor will actually eat a less good diet than they could, but spend that money on other things. Um, and then Nancy asked, how can they receive money without a smartphone? So this is the magic of mobile money. Mobile money works without a smartphone. It works just on feature phones entirely over like a text message interface. Um, and that's why mobile money is amazing in my opinion. It's really an incredible technology. Other questions? All right, I'm gonna keep going. Um, so I'm gonna show a little, just a couple slides on preliminary results in terms of how accurate these methods actually were for finding the poorest people. And then I'm gonna talk about some of these like larger social or ethical or um, whatever you wanna call them questions around the program. So the key question that we wanted to answer as researchers is like we came up with all these really complicated schemes for identifying the poor. We think that they were good. We think that they were especially good because we were able to do them very cheaply and without having to actually see people so entirely contact free. But we wanna know compared to like other types of targeting methods we could have used, how accurate were these methods? So in particular, we're gonna to compare to is we're gonna to compare to random targeting. So this is like a super naive baseline where we just say, what if we just given people money at random? Hopefully we're doing better than that. Um, we're gonna to compare to what if we'd just given people in the poorest prefectures, again, prefectures are like states, there's 40 of them in Togo. So we're gonna say, what if we just given people in the poorest, you know, two or three prefectures money? What if we'd just given people in the poorest cantons, like counties money, and like everybody in those cantons would, had been eligible? And lastly, we'll say, what if we'd actually gone and interviewed every single person um, and obtained what I was calling an asset index, kind of this, easy to measure measure of welfare that takes about 10 minutes to measure. What if we'd gone and collected that for every single person? How accurate would we have then been at finding the poorest people? So just to give a little bit of intuition on how this is what we're doing here. Let me just see if I can, there we go. Um, what we're doing here is that we have some kind of ground truth measure of welfare, right? And I keep saying that we're gonna use consumption. So how much did a household actually spend? And then we have some kind of sort of proxy measure of welfare. In the case of our program, that was consumption predicted based on mobile phone use. In other cases, it might be this, you know, this asset index that you collected for everybody. It might be just what was the average consumption in that area. Whatever is being used is kind of the proxy that we use to do the targeting. And then basically the way targeting works is what's being shown. So just let me back up a little bit here on the x-axis, we have the, uh, the ground truth consumption, actually true, how much was the household spending? On the y-axis, we have the proxy measure, how much are they predicted to be spending? Um, and then everybody below a certain level for that proxy measure is eligible to receive aid um, everybody above that level is not eligible to receive aid. And so that's what this, uh, this horizontal line is showing. And then in terms of who should have actually received aid, everybody below a certain level in terms of actual consumption should have received aid and everybody above a certain level should not have received aid. So that's what this vertical line is showing. So what you're gonna end up with is some people who should have received aid who did get it. That's what we're gonna call correct inclusion. Some people who shouldn't have received aid who did get it, that's shown here in the right quadrant, that's what we're gonna call incorrect exclusion. And then also some people who should have received aid who didn't get it, um, that's up here in the left quadrant, that's what we're gonna call um, incorrect inclusion. And then also some people who shouldn't have received aid who didn't get it, correct exclusion. So we're gonna measure um, how accurate our programs are on the basis of these different types of errors, inclusion errors and exclusion errors. We're gonna look at three different metrics for the accuracy of targeting. 
we're first going to use accuracy, which is just some people were classified as poor, some people were classified as not poor, and some people actually were poor and some people actually were not poor and what percent were classified correctly. The second is going to be what's called precision, which is going to be what percentage of the transfers that we gave out actually went to people who were poor. And the third one is called recall, which is what percent of people who actually should have gotten a transfer, what percent of poor people actually received a transfer. And then we're going to evaluate two different cash aid programs. The first is this program that we conducted with Give Directly, where in, the, in these hundred cantons that we selected to run the program in, 29% of people were eligible to receive aid. That was just based on how many transfers you were able to give out based on the budget. Um, and so the question is going to be, of those 29% of people that received aid, how, much, how many of those people were actually among the 29% poorest people in those cantons? Or also, just for the sake of larger policy, we're going to consider a hypothetical national program, which is going to say, what if we were the government of Togo and we wanted to use these targeting methods to give out money to the 5% poorest people in Togo? So this is not restricting to the 100 cantons we ran the Give Directly program, just in the whole country, if we use this method, and we gave it to the 5% predicted poorest people, what percent of those transfers would go to the people that were actually among the 5% poorest people? And so since we weren't able to, of course, survey everybody in Togo to answer these questions, we used representative survey data that we collected to answer these questions. So first looking at the Give Directly program, um, we're gonna use these three metrics again, accuracy, precision, and recall. If you don't remember what they were, just think generally that these are metrics to evaluate how accurately you're reaching the poor. We're going to consider random targeting, targeting everybody in certain prefectures, everybody in certain cantons, using our method based on cell phone data, CDR, and lastly using an asset index that we could go in person to collect the data and it would be quite expensive but hopefully collect quite good data. And the results that we get are actually pretty compelling in terms of um, the, the cell phone approach to targeting the aid we see that, um, in fact, the, the approach based on CDR is significantly better than any of the alternative approaches. That's the green bar is significantly higher than any of the other bars here, um, including if we'd gone in person and collected asset index data, which is a very interesting result. And then evaluating a hypothetical national program. So what if we tried to do this in the whole country and provide aid to the 5% poorest in the whole country? Um, we see maybe a little bit more of an intuitive result, but again, still promising, I would say, for cell phone data, which is still the green bar. We see that the green bar is significantly more accurate um, than either random targeting, giving money to people in certain areas, whether that's a prefecture or a canton, and just a little bit less accurate than going in person and collecting this asset index data, which would be quite expensive. So I think this is pretty much the result we expected to get, but it's definitely comforting to know that compared to sort of other alternative approaches to distributing the aid, this approach was either better than most alternatives or slightly worse than a much more expensive approach. Any other, actually I see there's a couple questions in the chat. So I'm gonna answer those. And if you have other questions um, about sort of the technical work, that's kind of the end of the technical section. So. Um, any other questions, now would be the time to add them. Um, is solar power the dominant source of power in villages? Um, some villages are on the electricity grid and some are not. Some villages only have solar power. Um, I don't know the exact distribution, it's a good question. Um, another question is, what are the biggest deterrents to moving up on the wealth scale in Togo? Substance abuse, employment opportunity, productivity. Great question. Um, a few different things, and this is like, I don't actually, I'm not an expert, so um, I don't want you to take this as like an expert opinion, but my impression is it's largely access to employment um, and access to education that are the, the, major, um, the major barriers. So Togo does not have a very strong educational system, so it's hard to, um, even with a college degree from the University of Lome, it's hard to get good employment. Um, and then Likewise, related to that, there's like not a lot of job opportunities outside of agriculture in Togo. Typically, the way people really succeed is to be able to, to go to France or somewhere else um, for employment. Do we get any pushback from the government giving out money um, when you said they weren't giving it to the right people? Um, good question. <laughs> um, so 
targeting is a really, yeah, it's a really sensitive political problem actually, because people don't want to be told that they're not giving money to the right people. I think in Togo, it's worked out quite well because the government's giving out the aid in the urban areas. And then together with this NGO, we're working on the rural areas. So we kind of did a divide and conquer um, strategy, which worked out really well. But I think more generally, there's like a really hard question here, which is like, we've developed this contact-free, very cheap approach to targeting, but it's not gonna be as good as like spending millions and millions of dollars to collect really good data and go in person and do like really good high quality data collection for targeting. So there's like basically a cost benefit trade-off. You can spend more and target more accurately, but then you have less money to give out to people versus you can target really cheaply, slightly less accurately, but more money to give away. And so I think that's like the real question is like, what's the cost benefit trade-off that people are willing to make to find the right people to target? Um, Robbie asked if there a strong national identity or is it more village or language based? That's an interesting question. Um, there is a strong national identity in Togo, I would say, which is interesting because it is so tribal. Um, at least that's my impression. I've, uh, I've only spent, part, spent time in certain parts of Togo. Um, but there is also a sort of strong ethnic, like ethnicity and language almost line up one to one. And so there is also strong ethnic identity and there is some ethnic tension. Um, Nancy asked how transferable is the method to other countries? Really good question. We're gonna find out soon because we're starting a related project in Bangladesh. Um, should be fairly transferable to any country where, um, where there's high mobile phone penetration. In fact, before this, I worked on a very similar project in Afghanistan. Um, so it's been tried in a few different places. The satellite imagery approach is very transferable, but you're gonna be more or less accurate in different countries. And that's, that's just gonna be the case depending on um, sort of the distribution of wealth and how people use their phone and so on. Um, and then, okay, last question I'm gonna answer for now. Robbie asked, does France or Quebec accept Togolese with their diaspora programs? Um, my understanding is France, France at least does to some extent, but I don't know the, the full extent. So I'm not gonna give a wrong answer. <laughs> All right, cool. Any other questions? Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Um, this is sort of the last main section of the talk. Um, and for me, perhaps the most interesting section of all and probably the section where I'll also explain why I'm not currently in Togo, um, which is thinking about some of these deeper questions about like, we find that we can predict wealth from phone data and satellite imagery. We find that we can build targeting for social protection based on AI, but like, should we? Um, which I think is a, for me, like I said before, probably the most interesting question of all. Oh, someone asked in the chat, is Togo a democracy? I'll touch on that one in this section too. Um, okay, I'm gonna talk about four different sort of deep ethical questions I think that come up. Um, the first is this question around digital exclusion, which someone asked in the chat, what's the phone ownership in Togo? What don't like the poorest people not have phones? So that's about people being excluded from the program on the basis of not having a phone. The second is about privacy and consent for using personal mobile phone data to determine eligibility for social protection. Um, the third is about um, algorithmic fairness and like, is this algorithm biased? Do we care? Should we care? Um, and then the fourth and last one is going to be about explainability. Um, do people understand the way this algorithm is determining their social protection payments? Should they understand? Do they have, do we have kind of a duty to explain it to them? Uh, and so on. Um, cool. Okay. The first one that I'll go through quickly is, uh, people being excluded from the program on the basis of not owning a phone. So this entire program, as I said at the beginning, and I said it in a really positive light, right? This entire program is done over the phone. Um, people register on the phone, whether or not they get to be included in the program is determined on the basis of their phone use. And then they're paid over the phone via mobile money. Um, all of this means that they can't receive the program if they don't have a phone or don't at least have a SIM card. That's actually an important distinction is that SIM cards super cheap in Togo, they cost about a dollar, a phone costs maybe more like 20 or $30. For the program, you actually only needed a SIM card, like you needed a unique SIM card that was belonged to you. Um, but you could take that SIM card and put it in someone else's phone and then register for the program and receive money via that other person's phone as long as they would let you borrow it. 
Um, in terms of actual phone penetration in Togo, 85% of households in the country own at least one phone, and 65% of adults report, report owning at least one phone. This is all based on survey data. Um, notably, there's significantly higher phone ownership among wet men than among women, and there's also significant variation in terms of geography and age. Generally, younger people own phones more than older people. Um, and people in the urban centers own phones more than people in rural areas, as you might expect. Um, so this is a big question, the, this idea of digital exclusion. I think the way um, it was justified largely in this program is that they needed to get money to people as soon as possible without going and talking to them. And this was definitely the only feasible approach. Um, this choice of using a, of like having the sort of unique identifier be a SIM card rather than a phone was purposely done to be able to, for the program to be able to be open to a lot more people than it, if it had been a phone. So anyone in all of Togo could go out and buy a SIM card and register and have the opportunity to potentially get money. Um, and that's like definitely, uh, I think that was a step forward, but in the future, um, there's a lot of talk with Give Directly and the other people we're working with about considering other routes into the social safety net. So in particular, is one idea that's been discussed a lot is the idea of doing this phone data-based targeting, the CDR-based targeting is kind of a fast track into the safety net so people can register via the phone and then quickly get money. But if they, get, if they are um, not eligible based on that, there are other routes into the safety net that they can go perhaps in person and have their uh, identity and poverty verified in person. So methods for recourse, basically. Um, next item is privacy and consent. I hope that maybe some of you were thinking about this as I was talking. Um, cell phone data was shared with us, the research team only, not the government by the two Togolese mobile phone operators, which was fully um, licensed and fully um, legal under Togolese data protection law. But that doesn't mean that it's right, in my opinion. Um, I think it's really important to think about, like, should people have to consent before their data is used for a program like this? Like, should, um, should, should it be a requirement that every person gives informed consent before their so cell phone data is analyzed to be used to determine their social protection. Um, I think the answer to that question, at least for me, might be different in and outside of an emergency context. So during COVID, I think I see a pretty strong argument that like um, this was basically the only or the best way to get money to as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. But it's not as clear to me that outside of an emergency, um, it's still sort of okay ethically to take people's phone data and use that without their permission to determine eligibility for a social protection program. Another thing that's been discussed a lot is like an opt out clause. So for example, when someone buys a phone, they could be automatically opted in to have their data shared with researchers to do this kind of stuff. Um, and then they would have an opt out option in their phone contract. Um, I don't know that an opt out option is good enough. So I think basically all I'm saying is, I don't know, but there's lots of really interesting ethical questions around um, this type of this, these privacy and consent questions. And I'm really excited to be working on some of this with some researchers in AI ethics um, in my program back at Berkeley. I also will say that I think there's some interesting technical solutions to some of this, like I'm working on some differential privacy and other sort of technical solutions for trying to make this data as private as possible while still doing useful inference on it. Um, a couple more and then I'll, I'll finish up. Um, another question is that of algorithmic fairness. So with these types of algorithms that are making really high stakes decisions, we might think that it's important that those, that algorithm is equally accurate for all types of people or perhaps for all different subgroups of different types of people. We might think that it's important that the algorithm is equally, equally accurate for men and women or that it's equally accurate for all 30 ethnicities in Togo or for different religions. Togo is very religiously diverse. Maybe it's important that it's equally accurate for Christians and Muslims and non-religious people. Maybe it's important that it's equally accurate for the elderly versus the young. Um, I don't know if any of this is like, I think these are all really deep questions for people in Togo. Um, first of all, whether this like, is it possible to make it equally accurate? Typically it is possible to train algorithms that satisfy fairness constraints, but even if it's possible, should it be? Is it ethically important that it's equally accurate? 
Um, what I'm showing down here in these graphs is on the left side for gender and on the right side for religion. Um, I'm showing the difference between predicted and true consumption for people based on, first of all, whether they're female or male on the left and on the right based on their religions, animist, um, which is like the local voodoo religions, Christian, Muslim, or other slash non-religious. And what this is basically showing is you can see for the genders, on average, people are typically predicted pretty much, like there's no big difference between women and men in terms of how they're predicted. Um, pretty much the algorithm's equally accurate for the two. But we can see among religions, it looks like on average, um, Muslims are generally predicted to be poorer than they actually are. Whereas Christians are generally predicted to be a little bit richer than they actually are. And that's not on purpose. That's not because we're putting religion into the algorithm and it's using that, but that's because religion is correlated with things like geography, which is correlated with things like phone use, which ends up coming out to the algorithm having different accuracy for different subgroups. This is what's often referred to in computer science circles as no fairness through unawareness. Like if we don't particularly force the algorithm to satisfy fairness constraints, it's likely that it's not going to. So in order to make an algorithm fair, unbiased, we have to actually tell it which subgroups it needs to be fair to. This becomes a really hard political problem. Um, and something that we're currently discussing with the government of Togo is like, which subgroup should be protected by an algorithm like this? Which subgroup should we force the algorithm to satisfy fairness constraints for? Um, super interesting problem. And also really hard for someone from the US context to like, go in and work on so we're trying to think about sort of ways to elicit local perceptions and local preferences over these types of questions. Okay, my last real slide um, is the, the last question I wanted to touch on just briefly is about algorithmic explainability and strategic behavior. So we might hope that algorithms that make high stakes decisions like this one, making a decision about whether or not you're gonna receive aid um, are explainable. We might want to be able to tell people, well, you didn't receive aid because, you know, you made five too many calls in the capital city and also too many of your calls were during the daytime and also, you know, and so on and so forth. So I put these graphs of future importance back on this slide. Um, unfortunately, there's like a real, there's two problems with this. First is it's hard to explain the way a complicated black box machine learning model works. But second, there's this big tension between explainability and strategic behavior. So the more you tell people how the model works, the more they can change their phone behavior to try to affect whether or not they receive aid. That's what we call strategic behavior. Um, because of this, it's very hard to offer good methods of recourse for people who should have received aid and didn't, unless you wanna sort of open up the black box of that algorithm which is why, again, we're thinking about other routes into the safety net and methods of recourse for people that are should have received aid but don't. All right, um, I'm gonna just do one slide on where this research is going and then um, I'm going to call it a day, maybe answer a couple more questions in the chat. Um, really quickly, in terms of ongoing research, um, we, this project is sort of pretty massive. It's really exploded from a year ago. And so we have a bunch of future directions of research. Um, the first is that we want to do an in-person audit of the targeting algorithm. It's really hard to audit an algorithm that's conducted, that's like being done over the phone um, without going in person because you're going to, for example, miss anybody who doesn't own a phone if you just do the audit over the phone. Um, I was supposed to be in Togo doing this in-person audit um, now, which is why I was supposed to give this talk in Togo. Unfortunately, COVID has really been spiking in Togo in the last three weeks or so. So I was actually um, came back from Togo early because of that. And um, our in-person work is basically uh, on hold indefinitely until COVID has calmed down a little bit in Togo. And it's a bit scary um, because Togo is not well prepared for COVID. Um, we're also doing some work on the impacts of these transfers. So, you know, we figured out if we're giving the right people the transfers, but now the question is, are those transfers helping people? Are they helping them eat good foods, sort of buy foods they need? Is it helping them pay for education fees for their children and so on? So we're doing a, a causal study of impacts of the transfers. Um, also interested in the impacts of the transfers on mobile money. So to the extent that these transfers were delivered via mobile money, does that cause sort of long-term mobile money use and financial inclusion? Um, lots of other sort of side projects happening. One that I'm really excited about is thinking about ways that these algorithms can be co-designed with local communities to 
um, sort of respect local values and to be able to document the trade-offs inherent to the algorithms for policymakers to really think about local values when using these algorithms for high stakes decision making. Okay, I'm gonna call it a day there. I wanted to quickly just um, acknowledge all of the amazing people that made this project possible. You're hearing from me, but I have an incredible team of research collaborators and research assistants. The people at Give Directly are amazing. The people in the Togolese government who built the NoVC platform are amazing. And we also have really generous funding from a whole bunch of sources. Um, and then lastly, I thought I would just end on some of the news coverage of this project. We've had some really, um, it's been awesome to have some really generous and positive news coverage. Um, so if you want to learn more about the project, I'll just drop a series of links in the chat um, to some of these different uh, articles and also some of our preliminary results. So let me just do that in case anyone's really interested. And yeah, I think that's it. I'm gonna leave this here. Actually, maybe I'll leave it here with some pictures from my time in Togo in the fall and in the last couple of months I was there up until last week um, working with these wonderful people. So here's some heartwarming pictures. So, so thank you very much. That was just fantastic. And, it, and it, if, if you're up for it, I mean, our noon is not our hard, hard deadline here. Another five or 10 minutes to answer some questions. Is that okay for you? Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry. It's, I realized I talked for ages. Um, no, but no, no. I was good with the questions also. And I, I have one. I, I have one directly to you. So all your training is in computer science, but clearly you've become very knowledgeable about the sociology and the economics of the system. To what extent are, is that a part of your formal training? I mean, are you just reading a lot? Are you <laughs> taking some other courses? I mean, for, for this kind of project, you clearly need to know a lot of things beyond the computer side of things. Yeah, I mean, I really believe that. I really believe that like people who are doing this kind of work that I'm doing should have a equal education, both in computer science and in the algorithmic stuff, but also in yeah, development economics in the ethical questions, um, in the sociological and cultural questions. So my background from undergrad was um, computer science, which of course has been very helpful for actually the algorithmic stuff. But then in grad school, I've been doing a lot in, in economics um, and also a lot in sort of AI ethics. So I'd say those are kind of my two other areas. I'm lucky to be in this interdisciplinary program where we can kind of choose our classwork as we see fit. And so I've spread out a bit and done these, these different areas. Your grandmother has a question. <laughs> Grandma, do you have a question? <laughs> what will you be doing in Bangladesh? And I'll scroll, if, if, people, if people wanna ask questions, they can, but if not, I'll scroll back through the chat because I know I missed a few. Um, I don't know yet about, I, the Bangladesh thing is uh, still uh, on the cusp of becoming a project. So it's possible it will still fall through, but um, we're looking at doing a similar project in Bangladesh, thinking about responding to future flooding events. So. Probably many of you know that Bangladesh is like in the worst danger of the whole world for um, experiencing really bad floods as a result of climate change and rising sea levels. And so we're interested in can cell phone data in particular and satellite imagery be used to identify areas and people that are really badly hit by floods and channel them cash. Okay. Other questions, if people want to shout them out, otherwise I'm going to, like I said, scroll back through the chat. See an interesting one here from Kathy about whether there's more than one, when there's more than one phone in the household, do they get multiple occurrences of aid money? This is actually a really interesting question because typically aid programs are delivered at the household level where like each household will get one transfer. Um, but our program was done at the individual level, largely just like logistically, that was what was feasible. We didn't know who was in the same household because we were doing it all remotely. So in our case, yes, um, multiple people in a household could get, um, could each get a transfer. And in some cases that was the case. Well, I, I have one on, on Togo. So African countries have a range of doing okay to being very corrupt. So where, where does Togo exist on this spectrum? Oh, right. Someone asked in the chat, is Togo a democracy? And I, I said I would answer it and then I didn't. Um, 
different people will answer that question differently. I'll answer it somewhat diplomatically. The same president has been in power in Togo or the, the, there was a president in power in Togo and now his son is in power. And they've been in power for, I wanna say 40 years, that family. Um, and so Togo is not a democracy by US standards. So the US hasn't exactly been a shining example of democracy lately. Um, but um, what was I gonna say? I would say that the people that we're working with in Togo, which is this Ministry of Digital Economy, um, are really amazing. They really, the minister uh, in particular and her staff really care extremely deeply about the well-being of people in Togo. And I think that's demonstrated. They coded literally day and night to set up this, um, this aid program for 10 days. And so they're just really impressively empathetic and wonderful people. Okay, so Bonita, you want to wrap things up? Yes, I want, thank you so much, Emily. That was really terrific. I know everyone enjoyed it. You can tell, especially from all the questions that you got. Yeah, so thanks for it was having me. Absolutely fascinating. And uh, we wish you the best thank in your you. future endeavors, whatever you do, wherever the wind takes you next. <laughs> so, and <clears throat> we'll see everybody next on the 18th, I believe, of, um, of April. And in the meantime, attend a class, do something nice for yourself, take a walk in nature and um, be safe.